Welcome back everyone to my round 4 recap from Beale. In this one, I was playing Cannon Master Lucas Forrester Yolamas, who is a pretty young player. And uh, so far this tournament, I, I've played young players, I think three out of four games. He is a junior, and um, in the first round he beat a player rated in the 2400s. So coming into this, I was ready for uh, a tough fight, but this game was actually surprisingly short. And I think I'll just leave it at that and let's hop into it. Um, I decided to play a move on move one that I almost never play in tournaments or online. Do people hear that? Someone call an ambulance. Or someone already called an ambulance. Oh, it's getting kind of loud. Uh, I might have some sound filter or something. Okay, the ambulance is passing. What was I saying? Oh yeah, so I played a move that I almost never play. The move knight to f3. The reti opening. Reti. Some people criticize me in the comments and tell me it's reti. But uh, it's an opening that I just never really got into over the years. Um, but it's a more flexible opening, and it can transpose into a lot of different things. Like, for example, if he plays c5, I could play e4 and go into a Sicilian. If he plays d5, I could go into a London. Uh, if knight f6, it can go into a zillion different uh, types of variations. But he very quickly played pawn to d5. And this surprised me a little bit because I would have expected him to take a little bit more time to decide his first move, given that there's no way he would have expected knight f3 from me on move one. And I did check his online games beforehand, and I was more expecting either knight f6 or c5. But I'll have to save my preparation for those moves for another day, because he played d5. And here I I was already like not quite sure what approach I should take. I was considering playing d4 and transposing into my bread and butter London opening, but I decided to play pawn b3. And I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and reveal that uh, if he were to play c5, I was gonna play b3 in this position. And I was basing my preparation off a game that he played against Vladimir Kramnik in title Tuesday, where eventually he played d5, bishop b2, knight f6, e3. Uh, basically, he got this position against Kramnik. Kramnik was white and just won a really nice game. It's basically a reverse Nimzo Indian, Queens Indian, um, but very nice kind of positional game from the white side. So when I played pawn b3, I was kind of hoping to transpose into some kind of line that resembled what he played against Kramnik. But here he still played very quickly, starting with knight f6. I play bishop b2, and then he plays bishop to f5. So if he were to play c5, I would have been in some pre-game prep. But bishop f5 was not on my computer before the game. But this is a position I've had before with the black pieces. Uh, because I, I like to play the London as white, and against this specific setup, I've played this position many times as black as well. Basically a London down a tempo. And I still had a, a general idea what to do, even though it wasn't specific preparation. I started with pawn to e3. He played pawn e6, and I played bishop to e2. And I was trying to remember some Hikaru Nakamura games, because Hikaru uh, plays the setup a ton in online blitz and bullet as e3 b3 i think he's made more popular over the last few years uh, just winning a lot of games very cleanly and the point of bishop e2 is a bit subtle but i'm trying to prepare knight h4 and i'm preventing the prospect of bishop g4 so if black just develops i could play knight h4 right away and essentially get the bishop pair uh, this bishop can run, but it can't really hide after d3. Um, and I think this would be a nice transformation for white, even if black opens h-file. Uh, the two bishops in the long term can just offer some nice chances to play for a win later on. So for that reason, going back after bishop e2, he very quickly played h6. And the ball is back in my court. I decided to play pawn to c4. 
which is one way to contest the center, creating the tension between the pawns. And then he pretty quickly played pawn to c5. And one thing I want to note is a part of my pregame preparation was actually looking at his previous games in the tournament and seeing his time management. And for a lot of players, like the time management isn't really a relevant part of pregame preparation. But I did note beforehand that in his previous games, he played basically every opening and every game beyond the opening just very, very quickly. There's at least one game he played where he finished the game with over two hours on his clock, and it was over 60 moves too. So I had the sense coming into this game that he would play very quickly in the opening, even if it was a line that he was not so familiar with. And I think part of the strategy kind of showed in, in this position, and maybe part of the, the deficiency in the strategy for him showed, because c5 is just, I think, a clear inaccuracy. Um, usually black should play c6 and keep this more solid triangle, uh, if I can draw arrows, triangle formation with the pawns. Um, the drawback of c5 is it's a bit committal, and it creates the idea for white of eventually taking. I do take right away. Now, if he takes back with pawn, at some point I'm going to play d4 and essentially force the trade of d pawn for c pawn, and that will leave black with an isolated queen's pawn, which can be a, a long term positional liability. So, in this position, I took a bit of a think because I wanted to play d4 right away, but I wasn't sure about lines with bishop takes b1. Like for example, d4, bishop b1, rook b1, queen a5, and there's times where I lose casting rights and maybe lose my a pawn or walk into some like eventual takes in bishop b4 check. So after taking a few minutes and trying to calculate these lines, I realize I can just keep things very simple and start with castling. Just get the king safe, not worry about checks along the diagonal, and there's basically no way for black to stop d4 on the next move. So yeah, I uh, I was feeling good here. He continues with knight c6, I play pawn d4, and he plays bishop to d6. I think this was his first longer think of the game, uh, spending about six minutes to play this move. And after d4, I think the position is already a little bit uncomfortable for black because if he takes, I take back with knight and it gains tempo on the bishop. Uh, so this would be very much in white's favor. And meanwhile, black wants to castle, but in order to castle, you have to move the bishop. And moving the bishop also loses time because I can take on c5. And um, yeah, black is just losing time in the opening. So after he played bishop d6, I was thinking I, I would just take on c5 very quickly, but I took some time here and, and realized there's another option where I just still leave the tension between the pawns and create additional ideas in the position. And I ultimately played knight to c3, which I think is a nice way to keep possibilities open in the position. Also just keep ways for black to go wrong here. Knight c3, of course, leaves the pawn tension, but it creates ideas of knight to b5 to harass the bishop on d6. And he told me after the game that he thought maybe he should play bishop e7 instead so the bishop doesn't get harassed. Uh, but one reason he played bishop d6 was to stop potential knight e5 ideas, which didn't actually cross my mind. But going forward from here, uh, he does castle, and I go ahead and play knight b5 hitting the bishop. And now it's a bit awkward for black because he either has to allow knight takes d6 or, okay, of course, if the bishop moves back this way, I just win the pawn on c5. And if he moves back to e7, then I would take, and black is losing a lot of time moving the bishop. Oh, my computer battery is low again. I keep forgetting to plug it in. Where's my charger? Here's my power adapter. Here's my charger. This is how technology works. Look, look, look. Yeah. Okay. We're good, I think. I managed to not electrocute myself. What was I saying? 
oh yeah, I was saying that Black is just losing a lot of time moving the darks for Bishop because we just saw Bishop d6, Bishop e7, Bishop c5. And then Black is losing even more time after knight d4 on kicking the bishop on f5. So going back to this position, he did not move his bishop from d6. He took on d4, which allowed me to take the bishop, and I was happy to do so. And then I take back on d4, and this was actually quite reminiscent of my second round game, at least in terms of the pawn structure. It's another kind of dream scenario for white with uh, the knights blockading the isolated queen's pawn on d5. Now, in the second round game, I'll link the recap somewhere probably below. Uh, if you saw that game, you'll know that it didn't have a happy ending. Uh, I spoiled what was a very nice position. My opponent was very resourceful in finding uh, counterplay. But in this game, it's just harder for Black to orchestrate any active play, um, especially after his next move, taking on d4. Generally, when you're playing against the isolated pawn, it's to your benefit to trade minor pieces. Sorry, there's a loud motorcycle outside having some distractions today. Let me say that again. So generally, when you're playing against the isolated pawn, it's to your benefit to trade minor pieces. Sorry, there's a loud motorcycle outside having some distractions today. Let me say that again. So generally, when you're playing against the isolated pawn, it's to your benefit to trade minor pieces. And yeah, now it's just a dream position. I have the queen bishop battery on the long diagonal. My other bishop is ready to come to f3. On top of that, I'm, uh, I'm actually tying down the rook to defending the a7 pawn. And for that reason, he pretty quickly played pawn to a6. Now, when he played pawn a6, I basically knew what I was going to play. But then I realized that there's a really nice tactical idea that I can set up in the position. And I didn't want to spend so much time here to give him time to think, to maybe realize a tactical idea. So I played my next move uh, relatively quickly, bishop to f3. And at first, this just looks like a very natural improving move, uh, putting more pressure on d5. But on the surface, it doesn't seem like this move has a threat. And he responded with rook c8, essentially ignoring the, the threat that I made with bishop f3. And in this position, there is a completely crushing move for white. Uh, this is white to move and win material. And I do urge viewers, if maybe you didn't see the game already or you don't see the move in the position, feel free to pause the video and find the move that my opponent overlooked. And he actually told me after the game that a couple seconds after he played rook c8, he saw what is coming. Um, now I took some time just to make sure that everything works out, but the move that I played is pawn to e4. And the reason why this is so strong, uh, there's actually a lot of things happening in this position. Uh, I should go back and just address the fact that there's two pins in this position. Even though it looks like e4 is controlled many times by the black pieces, uh, the knight is pinned to the g7 pawn, and the d5 pawn is pinned to the queen, which is not defended on d6. So for this reason, e4 is just completely working tactically because he can't take with the knight or the pawn. And if he takes with the bishop, I just take back. And he can't recapture because I either mate or win the queen. So uh, yeah, so e4, at first it looks like I'm going to win the pawn on d5. But it's even worse for black because I'm more interested in, of course, either winning the bishop or getting the fork of the queen and the knight. And it turns out there's no way for black to not lose a minor piece in this position. And I did feel a little bit bad for my opponent, given that um, yeah, he just kind of stumbled into a losing position very quickly out of the opening, maybe as a result of just not taking enough time and uh, doing the blunder checking. But he did take some time here to just cope with the reality. And we played a few more moves. Uh, Queen e6, I snagged the bishop and then rook to c1. And I was expecting him to resign a bit sooner, uh, but we did play a few more moves. Now in this position, he played rook e8, 
And I was actually hoping that he would go for a different line. I was uh, actually anticipating rook c2. And there's a funny line here, rook takes c2, queen takes c2. And I would have happily gone into this and played rook to c1, um, but black has one trick to play rook e8 and say, oh no, my queen. And of course, I would not take the queen because it's checkmate. So if we went into this, I would have played h3 and said, oh yes, my Luft, uh, just creating the, the pocket of error for the white king. Um, but that didn't happen. Uh, instead, he played rookie here. I still make Luft for my king. And after a few more moves, I won the pawn on b6. And then I trade on f6, and he resigned. So it was a very quick game. Uh, I think it finished less than an hour after the round began. So I was not expecting to have a game like this, but um, can't complain. Had some time to relax a little bit. Um, actually, after the game, I, I didn't relax immediately. I joined the commentary for about an hour, the official commentary of the tournament with Grandmaster Archer's Nikesons, and spent at least 45 minutes chatting with him and uh, showing this game, but also commenting on the top level Grandmaster games as well. So that was super fun. I'll leave a link if, uh, if anyone watching wants to check that out. Um, they are doing commentary daily for the top section for the Super Grandmasters. But yeah, it was a pretty quick day at the office. Um, I do appreciate everyone tuning in to these recaps. As usual, all the links will be in the video description if you want to analyze this game in more depth. If you want to check out the pairings or standings or my Twitch channel where Jonathan Trantz is doing commentary daily, uh, do send some love to him. But uh, I'm going to wrap it up, try and find some food. Stay tuned for round five, which begins in about 20 hours from now. So look forward to that and I'll see you guys soon.